In January, my husband and our daughter both died in a car crash. They hit a tree at 70 miles per hour and died instantly on impact. My son, Aiden, took it the hardest. Harder than me. He had been in the back seat of the car and had barely escaped death. But he did lose an arm. His right arm was taken off by a branch and he was lucky he didn't also die in that crash. Now it's just me and him. First, it was just a change in behavior. He acted odd, didn't talk much, and avoided coming down for dinner every now and again. He was still eating here and there, but he missed his dad and sister. Aiden was a daddy's boy, you could say, so I was patient with him for a while. Then he stopped eating completely, and whenever I approached him about it, he snapped and stormed off. Like I said, I understood. I had to be patient because I felt awful too, but I just didn't want Aiden to starve himself. It had gotten to the point where he was having violent stomach aches. I rushed into the doctors. You have to eat something, Aiden. I turned to him on the way home, and he silently nodded at me. When we pulled into the driveway, he rushed out of the car and up to his room. One month passed. Not one meal. Two, three, four, five. It just went on and on, and every time I asked, he just responded with something along the lines of, I'm not hungry. Don't worry, Mom. So I didn't. I let him be. I knew he was eating something because he couldn't survive on nothing for five months, but maybe he just wasn't comfortable eating at home. Eventually, I became sick of it. As a mother, I couldn't just let my son starve himself. It was now almost July and the accident was in January, and even I had started to return to some sort of normality, so I took it upon myself to cook something for him, a nice juicy steak with a side of french fries, and as I prepared the steak, the meat fell off the bone gently hitting the tray it sizzled in. Knock, knock, knock. I knocked before pushing Aiden's door open, turning on the light. I cooked you some- I stopped, frowning. Aiden had something in his mouth which he was chewing like his life depended on it, and so I set the plate down on his drawers. Aiden? I stepped into his room as he swallowed whatever he was eating. Nothing, just the Snickers from the fridge. Aiden seemed nervous and sort of ushered me out of the room. I accepted it and left the plate in there, standing silently as he closed the door behind me. The following day, something compelled me to look inside the fridge, and when I did, I regretted it. I had taken comfort in knowing Aiden was eating something, at least, but it turns out that the multi-pack of Snickers I'd bought wasn't even opened. So what the hell had he been eating? Something compelled me to find out, so my first course of action was to install a camera just outside of his room to see if I could catch him leaving the room to get food. A little pathetic, but I worry. Mothers do. I slept well that night, knowing that come morning, I'd know. And I did. The camera picked up movement just after 4am, and my son left his room to go downstairs. And around 30 minutes or so later, it picked up movement again, of him going back to his room with a small plate of meat. Perhaps it was the steak? But I had left that in his room. It was strange, because he didn't leave his room after that. Aiden? You awake, sweetie? I knocked on his door. No answer. So I let myself in to see him sleeping silently, and I smiled a little, only to see the steak I'd cooked completely untouched on his drawers. I picked it up and left, going back downstairs. Just where was he getting the food from? I know that you may be thinking this is no big deal, but I just wanted to know. Because it wasn't from the fridge or anything of the sort, but it was on the plates from downstairs. And then I decided I'd catch him in the act. Again, pathetic, but I was seriously worried at this point. At 4am I heard movement, so I followed him downstairs quietly and out into the garden? In the dark I saw a figure. It stood with one arm holding what appeared to be a shovel and the other arm missing. I stepped out into the backyard, causing the sensor to turn on and a dim light to illuminate the garden. The figure turned, revealing my son's face, mouth dripping with drool and standing in front of a small hole in the dirt. I stumbled backwards and fell to the ground, covering my mouth and muffling my screams. Oh, have I forgot to mention my husband and daughter were buried in the backyard? My son, Thomas, never had a shortage of friends. Always the class clown, always the likable, relatable, funny goof that he was. He passed away two months ago. He jumped off an overpass and landed on his neck. He was 17, and I'm writing this for him because he wanted me to. I know a lot of you 
know about the internet and the dark web and all that. The thing is, I didn't. And maybe if I had, my son would still be alive. Please, stay off the dark web. The game is called Veritatum Desire, and I'm an American English speaker, but I believe it means something along the lines of to tell the truth in Latin. I only began to notice things after his last few months. Troubles at school, which he had never had. He sat behind a girl in his class and cut a chunk of hair off her head. He was suspended. I would look through the history on his computer to find violent videos, people being murdered and sodomized, video after video, white powder substance all over his room, salt lining his windows. We took him to the dentist because of an infection on one side of his mouth. The dentist examined him and pulled me aside to let me know that my son had pulled out and crushed three teeth in his mouth himself. The last straw was when I caught him in the bathroom about two months before he died. He was carving some sort of symbol into his arm on a live stream. I figured his odd behavior must be a cry for help, thinking maybe he was depressed or suicidal. He was hospitalized for a week and then released. Two weeks later, my son died. A month before my son died, every person in my family received an email. Each one read, Ask Thomas about the little girl who died down the street. Ask him what he knows. Make him tell the truth. The email came from an anonymous sender and when confronted with it, Thomas began to get very nervous and visibly sick. Who sent it, Thomas? I want to know. If this is some sick prank to scare your little sister, it's not funny. I leaned against the counter and crossed my arms. The email pulled up on the laptop in front of my son. He kept his head low, avoiding eye contact with me, staring at his fingers in his lap. I don't know what it is, Mom. Probably some spam email or something, he muttered, almost looking up at me, but quickly averted his gaze. A spam email that happens to have your name in it and information on the crime committed down the street a few weeks ago? I don't think so. I glanced at the screen for a moment. So, do you know something you're not telling your father and I about this? I said, looking back at him again. No. Tears welled up in his eyes as he stared at the computer screen. I don't know anything. What is going on with you, Thomas? This is so unlike you. Please, if you're not okay, please just tell us. We want to help you. We want our Tom back. I put my hand in his, but he quickly pulled away and wiped his eyes quicker. I don't know anything, Mom. I already told you. I'm fine. He got up abruptly and started towards the doorway. Now, I could feel the tears begin to form in my eyes as I saw him walk away. My son was almost unrecognizable. He was skin and bones, purple bags under his eyes like he hadn't slept in days. His clothes hung and bagged on him as I saw him walk to the door. I love you, I squeaked out. He stopped for a moment and looked back at me. And I swear to God, I'd never seen more pain in someone's eyes than I saw in his in that moment. He let a tear fall as he turned away again, his back to me now. I love you, Mama. He croaked out before exiting the room quickly. He began to look worse as time went on. Thin, frail, tired, fatigued. My husband and I found therapists, took him to doctors, pulled him out of school, and did everything we thought was right leading up to my son's suicide. About a week after his death, I felt like half of me was missing. I couldn't move or talk or get out of bed, and I didn't. All I could do was think about Thomas, and the guilt ate me alive. I knew my email had to be overflowing with emails from clients at work, and I knew I'd have to get back to work soon. For me, for my husband, for my daughter. Two weeks later, I finally checked it. At the very top of my inbox was an email with an anonymous sender and no subject. I began to tear up wishing whoever it was would just leave me alone and let me grieve. But curiosity got the better of me, and I opened it. I wish I hadn't. The email was nothing but nine black words that read, 
he did it. And the game is not over.